Hello, Hello friends. In, in this, this lecture, we will discuss the other type of electron microscopy that is scanning electron microscopy. We will talk about the components of SEM and their functions, the working principle of scanning electron microscopy, the ray diagram, the applications of scanning electron microscopy, the advantages and limitations of scanning electron microscopy. We will then move on to discuss about the specimen support used and methods of sample preparation for electron microscopy. The lecture will also include the discussion on differences between TEM and SEM followed by differences between light microscopy and electron microscopy. SEM produces the image of a sample by scanning it with high energy beam of electrons. The electrons interact with atoms and produce various signals that contain information about the sample's topography and composition. Let us talk about the major components of a scanning electron microscope. The major components of the scanning electron microscope include an electron gun. It generates a beam of electrons. It can be a hot tungsten filament or lanthanum hexaboride gun located at the top of the column. This is where the electrons are produced under thermal heat at a voltage of 1 to 40 kilowatts. The next is condenser lens. The condenser lenses focuses the beam of electrons from the source through the column forming a narrow beam of electrons that form a very fine point. The next component is scanning coils. They are used to deflect the electron beam over the specimen surface. Yet another component is the secondary electron detector. It attracts the electrons that bounce off the sample and turns them into electrical current. The functioning of the detectors highly depends on the voltage speed and the density of the specimen. The next component is a photomultiplier. It measures the electrical current from the detector and turns it into an image on the screen. Yet another part is the vacuum system. It is required when using an electron beam because electrons will quickly disperse or scatter due to collisions with other molecules. The vacuum is generally created using a diffusion pump. The next is the imaging system. It allows visualization of an electronic signal using a cathode ray tube and permits recording of the results using photographic or magnetic media. However, in recent years, <coughs> Liquid crystal display, that is LCD, has replaced cathode ray tube and the image is recorded in the digital format. Let us talk about the working principle of the scanning electron microscope. SEM is said to combine the mechanisms of electron microscopy and television. A beam of electrons is generated in the electron gun located at the top of the column. This beam is attracted through the anode condensed by a magnetic condenser lens and focused not as a broad inverted cone but as a very fine point on the sample by the objective lens. The scan coils are energized 
by varying the voltage produced by the scan generator and create a magnetic field which deflects the beam back and forth in a controlled pattern. The varying voltage is also applied to the coils around the neck of the cathode ray tube which produces a pattern of light deflected back and forth on the surface of the CRT. The pattern of deflection of the electron beam is the same as the pattern of deflection of the spot of light on the CRT. The electron beam hits the sample producing secondary electrons from the sample. The intensity of this secondary radiation is dependent on the angle of inclination of the object's surface. These electrons are collected by a secondary detector or backscatter detector and converted to a voltage and amplified and converted into a signal that is sent to a screen similar to a television screen. This produces the final image. The SEM has a large depth of field which allows a large amount of the sample to be in focus at one time. The SEM also produces images of high resolution which means that closely spaced features can be examined at a high magnification. Let us see a few SEM images. This is the picture of fallen grains. These are red blood cells. These are our very own E. coli cells and these are Staphylococcus aureus. In this picture, you can see the flagella of a rod-shaped bacterial cell. The flagella are extremely thin filamentous extracellular appendages which cannot be seen by light microscope. The number of secondary electrons reaching the detector depends upon the nature of the specimen surface. When the electron beam strikes a raised area, the number of electrons is more as compared to when it strikes a depression. Therefore, the raised areas appear lighter on the screen and depression appears darker. A clear and focused topographical image of the sample is produced. Each element in the sample appears as a different shade from almost black to white. Let us now talk about the applications of scanning electron microscopy. The combination of higher magnification Larger depth of focus, greater resolution and ease of sample preparation makes the SEM one of the most heavily used instruments in research areas today. The high resolution three dimensional images produced by SEMs provide topographical, morphological and compositional information making them invaluable in a variety of science and industrial applications. SEMs can be an essential research tool in fields such as life science, chemistry, gemology, medical and forensic science and metallurgy. In addition, SEMs have practical industrial and technological applications such as semiconductor inspection, production line of minuscule products and assembly of microchips for computers. Let us now focus on the biological applications. In the field of virology, it is used for studying the virus structure in detail. The viruses are very small, even smaller than the bacterial cells. SEM can be used to obtain anatomical pictures of insects, worms and spores. SEM has been useful for exploring effects of antibiotics in bacterial morphology and ultrastructure to enhance understanding of their mechanism of action. 
Localizing specifically tagged proteins in cell organelles like mitochondria has been made possible via SEM. In medicine, SEM has been used to explore tissue and cells and can facilitate diagnosis of disease. In forensic science, SEM is utilized to analyze and trace evidence such as gunshot residue, hairs, fibers, glass paint fragments and fingerprints. <coughs> Let us now discuss the advantages of scanning electron microscopy. Advantages of scanning electron microscope includes its wide array of applications, the detailed three-dimensional and topographical imaging, and the versatile information garnered from different detectors. SEM magnifies image more than 5 lakh times. It is possible to investigate greater depth of field. SEM is easy to operate with proper training. Advances in computer technology and associated software makes the operation user friendly. SEM works very fast. In addition, the technological advantages in modern SEMs allow for the generation of data in digital form. Samples must be prepared before being placed in the vacuum chamber. Most SEM samples require minimal preparation actions. There are however a few disadvantages or I will say limitations of scanning electron microscopy. <coughs> The most important disadvantage of scanning electron microscopy is its size and cost. SEMs are expensive and large. They must be housed in an area free of any possible electric, magnetic or vibration interference. Maintenance involves keeping a steady voltage currents to electromagnetic coils and circulation of cool water. Special training is required to operate an SEM as well as prepare samples. The preparation of samples can result in artifacts. The negative impact can be minimized by knowledgeable, experienced researchers being able to identify artifacts from actual data as well as preparation skill. There is no absolute way to eliminate or identify all potential artifacts. In addition, SEMs are limited to solid, inorganic samples, small enough to fit inside the vacuum chamber that can handle moderate vacuum pressure. Finally, SEMs carry a small risk of radiation exposure associated with the electrons that scatter from beneath the sample surface. The sample chamber is designed to prevent any electrical and magnetic interference which should eliminate the chance of radiation escaping the chamber. Even though the risk is minimal, SEM operators and researchers are advised to observe safety precautions. In the case of light microscopy, we use the glass slide as our specimen support. However, for electron microscopy, the specimen support is going to be different. Let us discuss about this specimen support. The sample for electron microscopy should be very thin, otherwise no electron beam can pass through it to form the image. Such a thin section of the sample has to be supported on a solid support. A glass support is of no use since it is opaque to the electron beam. Hence, solid supports called grids, typically made of copper, nickel or gold with mesh sizes of 200 to 400 holes per inch are used. The grids are overlaid with a thin electron transparent film 
called the support cell. A carbon cell is ideal for this purpose. Grids are coated with a thin film of plastic such as foam bar and on this is deposited a thin film of carbon by carbon arc evaporation. Shortly before the particulate material is to be prepared for TEM examination, the grid is immersed in chloroform to dissolve away the film of plastic leaving only the carbon film covering the grid. Once the specimen support is made, the specimen is prepared by different methods like staining, sectioning, shadow casting, negative staining, free structuring, etc. about which we will talk in the coming slides. Let us now talk about the basic specimen preparation required for electron microscope. The first step is cleaning of the specimen. The second step is primary fixation of the specimen. Next, rinsing of the specimen. Secondary fixation of the specimen. Dehydration of the specimen. Drying of the specimen. Mounting of the specimen on the specimen support. Coating of the specimen. Let us now talk about each of these steps in slight detail. Cleaning of the specimen. Proper cleaning of the surface of the sample is essential because the surface can contain unwanted deposits like dust, silt or media components. The best way of cleaning is to carefully rinse the sample three times for 10 minutes in 0.1 molar cacodylic acid buffer with the pH of 7.4 at room temperature. Biological material contains large quantities of water. Since the TEM works in vacuum, the water must be removed. To avoid disruption as a result of the loss of water, the tissue has to be preserved by the use of certain fixators. Primary fixation. The sample is first fixed with glutaraldehyde, which covalently links protein molecules to each other. The next step is rinsing. After the fixation step, samples must be rinsed to remove excess glutaraldehyde. This is brought about by washing again with 0.1 molar cacodylic acid buffer. The next is secondary fixation. It is done with 1% osmium tetroxide which binds to and stabilizes the lipid bilayers. Dehydration. Complete dehydration is brought about by alcohol or acetone. Generally, the sample is exposed to 50% ethanol for 5 minutes, 70% for 10 minutes, 80% for 10 minutes, 90% for 15 minutes, and 99.9% for 20 minutes. This process allows the water in the sample to be slowly exchanged through liquids with lower surface tension. The next step is drying. The electron microscopes operate with vacuum. Hence, the specimens must be completely dry or they would get destroyed in the electron microscope chamber. Generally, carbon dioxide is removed after its transition from liquid to gas phase and the specimen is dried without structural damage. The next step is mounting. After the sample has been cleaned, fixed, rinsed, dehydrated and dried, it must be mounted onto the specimen support using an adhesive such as epoxy resin or an electrically conductive double-sided adhesive tape. The next step is coating or staining. The idea of coating or staining the sample is to increase its conductivity in the electron microscopes and to prevent the buildup of high voltage charges on the specimen. Typically, specimens are coated with a thin layer of approximately 20 to 30 nanometers 
of a conductive material like gold, palladium or platinum. This is usually done by a machine called putter coater. For TEM, ultra thin specimens are required. The process of cutting specimens into ultra thin sections of about 70 to 90 nanometer thickness is known as ultra microtomy. After the fixation of the specimen, it has to be embedded in resin that polymerizes into a solid hard block. The block is cut into thin sections by a diamond knife in an instrument called ultra microtome. Each section is only 50 to 100 nanometers thick. The thin sections of the sample is placed on a copper grid and stained with the solutions of heavy metals like molybdenum, lead, uranium or tungsten. The ions react with proteins and other macromolecules and make them more electron opaque and thus increase the contrast. The strained thin sections are then viewed under the electron beam. Let us quickly revise what we have just studied about the specimen preparation. A small piece of tissue is placed in a fixative like glutaraldehyde. It is washed and transferred to another fixative like osmium tetroxide. The sample is then dehydrated by exposing to a gradient of ethanol and then washed with propylene oxide. The tissue is then mixed with a resin in vials. The resin or plastic polymerizes and forms a block which is trimmed for sectioning. The tissue is sliced into sections approximately 100 nanometers thick as block moves down across the sharp edge of a diamond knife. Sections float in the trough of the water just behind the knife edge. The ultra thin sections are placed on the grid and stained with heavy metal salt solution and finally observed in TEM. Let us now discuss the next method of specimen preparation that is negative stain. Although individual macromolecules such as DNA or proteins can be visualized in the electron microscope if they are shadowed with a heavy metal to provide contrast, finer detail can often be gathered by negative stain. Here, macromolecules or supramolecular assemblies are adsorbed from their suspension onto a thin carbon support film and then briefly washed with an aqueous solution of a heavy metal salt like 1% uranyl acetate. The sample is then allowed to dry. A very thin film of metal salt now covers the support film everywhere except where the macromolecules have adsorbed. Because the macromolecule allows the electrons to pass much more readily than does the surrounding heavy metal film, a reverse or negative image of the molecule is created, hence the name negative staining. Negative staining is particularly useful for viewing large supramolecular assemblies such as viruses or ribosomes and also for seeing the subunit structure of protein filaments like that of the actin filament. Figure shows a negative preparation of viral particles. A drop of solution containing the viruses is deposited onto the grid and a drop of heavy metal salt solution is then deposited onto the grid. After a few seconds, the excess solution is drained off and the grid allowed to dry before observation in the TEM. The electron opaque salt solution deposits around the relatively electron transparent virus particles. This causes the virus particles to appear light against a dark background on the TEM screen, hence the term negative staining. This figure 
shows the negative staining of adenovirus particles. The next method is freeze fracture or freeze etching. Freeze fracture electron microscopy provides a means of visualizing the interior of cell membranes, allowing the study of the in plane distribution of integral proteins spanning the lipid bilayer and of other membrane features. A small block of biological tissue or a droplet of cell suspension on a copper grid or gold support stabilized by glutaraldehyde fixation is first rapidly frozen by plunging it manually into liquid nitrogen. The frozen specimen is placed on specimen support or the copper grid. The frozen block is cracked with a knife blade. The fracture plane often passes through the hydrophobic middle of lipid bilayers, thereby exposing the interior of the cell membrane. For etching, the specimen is exposed to vacuum for a minute so that some ice can sublimate and uncover more details. Exposed surfaces are coated with the ultra-thin heavy metal and carbon films deposited under vacuum. The supporting layer of carbon stabilizes the structures which are uncovered by metal. After the coating process, the biological structure is washed away with acids and cleaned with distilled water. Only the replica made of metal and carbon is left. This is then placed on PEM and observed under the electron microscope. The next method is shadow casting. In this method, the particles in the suspension are sprayed onto a grid overlaid with a support cell. The liquid is made to evaporate in vacuum. The heavy metal is applied by evaporation from an acute angle such that the metal will pile on only one side of the sample particles. As the metal gets deposited at an angle, it piles up on the side from which it is deposited while the other side remains clear. When viewed in the TEM, there will be minimal transmission of electrons through the metal piled up on one side of the virus particle and high transmission of electrons through the shadow where no metal was deposited. In electron microscopy, the areas with stain show dark while areas with no stain appear bright. Not only does this technique show up the virus particles, but it also provides some information on the surface structure of these particles. Let us see a few images of shadow casting procedure. This image is that of a bacteriophage. As I said before, the areas with stain show dark while areas with no stain appear bright. This picture is of bacilli and cocobacilli and this is of the tobacco mosaic virus. The picture here shows shadow casted poliovirus particles. Not only does this technique show the virus particles, but it also provides some information on the surface structure of the bacteria like that of flagella. See this picture of a flagellated bacteria. The flagella can be seen very distinctly. Let us now discuss the differences between the both the types of electron microscopies, SEM and TEM. The image in SEM is formed by scattered electrons whereas in TEM it is formed by transmitted electrons. The SEM forms a 3D image but the TEM forms a 2D image. Maximum magnification obtained by SEM is 2 million times but that of TEM is up to 50 million times. SEM can resolve objects as close as 20 nanometers whereas TEM has a much higher resolution than SEM. It can resolve objects as close as 1 nanometer. In SEM, sample preparation is easy. 
The sample has to be coated with a thin layer of heavy metals such as gold or palladium. Whereas in PEM, the sample has to be cut thinner because electrons cannot penetrate very far into the material. And hence, ultra-thin specimens are needed. SEM allows for a large amount of sample to be analyzed at a time, but with PEM, only a small amount of samples can be analyzed at a particular time. SEM provides detailed images of the surfaces of cells. SEM focuses on the sample's surface and its composition, so SEM shows only the morphology of the samples. Transmission electron microscope is used to view thin specimens. PEM can show many characteristics of the sample such as internal composition, morphology, crystallization, etc. Let us now discuss the differences between optical or light microscopy and electron microscopy. The source of illumination 